Good morning, everyone, and a big welcome on uh, this lovely spring day that is facing us today. We definitely had some better weather the past few days, but I'm still excited that the first day of spring has come and gone, and, uh, and we're ready to get into a really brand new season. So I want to welcome everybody today. My name is Amy Henson. I am a scientist at Science North in Sudbury, Ontario, and I'm really excited to be hosting this very special lecture today in conjunction with Science North and Laurentian University. But first things first, of course, we want to acknowledge, of course, where we are located. And it gives me great pleasure to begin that we would like to acknowledge the Robinson-Huron Treaty here of 1850. We also recognize that Science North and Laurentian University are located on the traditional lands of the Tikamekshing and Anishinaabe. And the greater city of Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of the Wanapate First Nation. We'd also like to acknowledge the Gardner Foundation for supporting us today in this presentation. The Gardner Awards recognize and reward international excellence in fundamental research that impacts human health. And I can't think of a better year to be talking about human health and, um, and the science that goes along with how we study human health. And we have our guest today is one of those recipients, Dr. Guy Hulo. Um, and I think what's most exciting about this, though, is Dr. Rulo's actual tie to Sudbury and to Northern Ontario. And while he was born in Ottawa, his mother's family is all from Sudby, Sudbury. And we were very excited to learn that when we first learned of his work. Um, he's also a really proud Franco-Ontarian. Um, and later this morning, he'll actually be delivering a second session in French as well. So if you'd like to catch that en français, you can join us later this morning. But who is Dr. Rulo? Well, Dr. Rulo is the director of the Montreal Neurological Institute Hospital. It's otherwise known as the Neuro, which I think is kind of a really cool name. Um, he's the professor and chair of the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill University and the director of the Department of Neuroscience at McGill University Health Center. And he is this year's recipient of the Canada Gardner Whiteman Award in, in 2020 um, for his work in identifying the genetic architecture in neurological and in, in neurological and psychiatric diseases. So these include things like ALS, um, autism, schizophrenia, um, and he has this really interesting background and leadership in the field of open science. And we'll talk a little bit about open science today, I'm sure, because I find that topic incredibly interesting. Uh, and he has identified many genetic risk factors that predispose to a range of brain disorders. So things like ALS, autism, autism. And like a really great example of this is the important advances um, in identifying the most prevalent genetic risk factors for ALS. Um, and, uh, and now that work that he's done has been um, part of some really amazing core work and innumerable ALS studies that have been done worldwide and a really, really important research to, um, for this particular disease. Dr. Rulo's also played a pioneering role, as I mentioned, in open science. So he helped transform the Montreal Neurological Institute Hospital, the Neuro, that really cool name, into the first open science institution in the world. The Neuro now uses open science principles to transform research and care and accelerate the development of new treatments for patients through open access, open data, open biobanking, open early drug discovery, and non-restrictive intellectual property, which means that all that data is available to anyone around the world who wants and needs to use it for their research. And it just works to help build better science around the world. And a really good example of this is open science has been really highlighted right now, right now in our COVID crisis. And COVID is the best example on how this open science was adopted right from the very beginning um, and having open data and research available and having that research available has possibly saved millions of lives around the world. So you can see by far the importance of having open data and open science available. By sharing our scientific data, we can all benefit from collective thinking and research for the health of ourselves and for society. So I am very excited to welcome our 2020 Gardner Lecture Series today. And I would love to welcome Dr. Rulo. So come on on, Dr. Rulo. How are you this morning? Very good, thank you. Thank Excellent. you for a kind introduction. You're very welcome. I'm excited. I wish we had you here in Sudbury, brought you kind of back home to your roots a little bit, but mm -hmm. that's okay. Well, we'll, we'll and I, I am, and where are you located right now? 
I'm in Montreal. I, I'm at, uh, at actually in my house, at my home, because we're not allowed to go to work uh, unless uh, it's to see patients or uh, where one has to be on site at the hospital. So I work from home uh, a few days a week and from the hospital a few days a week. So yeah, that, that's, I think, the, the reality of all of our lives. And even 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 scientists and doctors, right? That's <laughs> Yeah. That's certainly the certainly way we go. So, um, so just about before I hand everything over to Dr. Rulo for his amazing presentation today, I just want to mention that if you have, as our audience, any questions or comments at all, you can feel free to put them in the chat. I'll be taking a look at them, looking and seeing what sort of great questions and comments you have. And then at the end of Dr. Rulo's presentation, we'll pop them up and I'll be able to ask them um, and make sure that we get some of your questions answered today. So if you have any questions during the presentation, just put them in the chat and, uh, and we'll be ready to go. So Dr. Rulo, I'm gonna hand everything over to you and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to give this lecture. In fact, uh, I would have very much liked to have gone to visit, but uh, <laughs> I guess that's not uh, not uh, my fate on this uh, this occasion. So, uh, I, uh, I I must confess I have a lot of nice memories from visiting uh, visiting uh, Sudbury. My uncle had a cottage outside of Sudbury, and this is where we would uh, we would go on many occasions. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen, uh, which uh, would be to show the slides. And I'm going to uh, talk about the, the subjects that were mentioned. Uh, essentially, I'm going to do uh, an overview about uh, the kind of work that I've been doing over the many years of my career. And uh, I'll start off with, uh, with uh, this quote uh, from uh, Sir William Osler, who uh, began his career at McGill University, and this is kind of, uh, I like this quote, uh, to wrest from nature the secrets which have perplexed philosophers in all ages, to track to their sources the cause of disease, these are our aims. So I'm going to talk about neurogenetics to open science. First disclaimer is that I have no conflicts of interest or any financial interest in the research that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the second disclaimer is uh, the people in my lab, uh, the students and postdocs, essentially, uh, they want to be certain uh, uh, everyone knows that I actually did none of the physical work. So all the work I'm going to present has been done by talented students uh, and postdocs and technicians in my lab. The first disease I'm going to talk about is my amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's a disease where one has uh, amyotrophy, so one has uh, melting away of muscle. So loss of muscle mass, and one has death of motor neurons. So you can see a dying motor neuron. And in addition to that, you have sclerosis in the lateral part of the spinal cord. These white areas you can see on either side is where the, cortical, the lateral corticospinal tract normally occurs. So one has sclerosis in the lateral parts of the uh, spinal cord and amyotrophy, hence the name amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. My career has focused on the genetic forms of ALS, and uh, about 10% of cases are familial. Primarily autosomal dominant, those are some recessive uh, families, and there are other families that are small that suggest uh, incomplete penetrance, and so different kinds of inheritance patterns. What's important is that the familial ALS is really indistinguishable from sporadic ALS, SALS, except that the age of onset is on average five years younger in familial ALS, and the sex distribution is equal male to female in familial, and there's a slight uh, male uh, pre uh, predominance in sporadic ALS. So uh, this uh, disease, familial ALS, was described in this journal in 1880, uh, and this uh, paper, the first paper, was by Sir William Moser. So Moser actually, uh, he's the one who, uh, who was the first to describe familial ALS. And remember, he was in Montreal, and he talked about a hereditary progressive muscular atrophy, which is now we would call ALS, in the far family of Vermont. So it's a Vermont family. This is a genealogy of the family. And as you can see uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, bold characters are those people who are affected. And you can see it is autosomal dominant. It goes from generation to generation. Uh, and you can see that ethics was somewhat different uh, in 1880. 
in that the names of the people are there and there are some uh, de details which one would, would, would not include, like for example, Russell Farr was a drinker. So uh, he described this disease, familial ALS, and this is basically a survival curve of individuals with familial ALS. And you can see that about half of the people have died by, by two years after diagnosis. And uh, there are some prolonged survivors, but in fact, uh, it is quite a, quite a deadly disease. So uh, I began working on this in 1986. Uh, and in 1993, four groups working together that included my group uh, identified SOD1 mutations in familial ALS. And as it turns out, about 15% of familial ALS are caused by mutations in SOD1. And some small percentage, maybe 1% of all ALS cases, have uh, SOD1 mutations. It is a small protein, but uh, there's many different mutations that can lead to the disease. They're all dominant except two recessive forms uh, that are, well, one is very rare. The D96N is very rare. The D90A uh, it has a fairly high prevalence in certain parts of Sweden uh, and uh, Finland. There are some genotype-phenotype correlations, and this is important. The A4V has a, a rapid progression, and this, in fact, is a mutation of the Farr family, uh, the Vermont family described by, uh, by, Dr., uh, uh, by our, our, our friend Sir William Mosner. And there are others that are slow progressors. Some uh, affect earlier onset, and uh, SOD1 mice have been very useful to try to understand the biology of this disease. Uh, the next gene that was identified was TDP43, and uh, in 2006, Newman et al. basically took brains of people who had frontotemporal dementia, uh, where there were inclusions in uh, neurons, and uh, isolated the protein from these inclusions and did sequencing of proteins and found that uh, TDP43 was quite frequent in these inclusions of in frontotemporal dementia. But then when they looked, they saw that these inclusions, TDP43 inclusions, actually were uh, the most common kind of inclusion in ALS as well. Uh, this was uh, basically a strong linkage between frontotelular dementia and ALS. So we decided to look at that. So we looked at 200 well-diagnosed ALS patients, familial ALS 80, 120 sporadic ALS, and sequenced the gene. And what we found was mutations in the cases and virtually no mutations or far fewer mutations in the controls. And these were three in the familial ALS and six in the sporadic ALS. And so uh, this was then, so we showed that this was a gene that uh, uh, predisposed to ALS. At the same time, another group found mutations in the same gene. TDP43 and TARB-BP TARB -BP are the same gene, just two different names. And then since then, many mutations have been reported. It accounts for about 5% of familial ALS and probably less than 1% of sporadic ALS. But TDP43, as I mentioned, uh, immunohistochemistry defines a large subgroup of ALS. And since then, many mutations have been identified. The vast majority are in this glycine-rich uh, domain, which actually is a prion-like domain. So it's a domain that has characteristics similar to the prion protein. Uh, which is consistent with a prion-like uh, mechanism of disease in ALS. Since then, uh, many, many genes have been identified. So this is the SOD1 gene in 1993. Uh, this is TDP43. And the size of the bub bubble is how frequently uh, the gene causes ALS, or if you look at from, from, uh, ALS cases, this is a C9RF72. And you have FUS that was found at uh, almost the same time as TDP43, TDP43 bit earlier. So increasing number of ALS patients. And this is the number uh, of, uh, uh, you can see the, uh, the percent of ALS cases that are explained by these genes. Now over 20% of ALS cases are explained by these genes. So just to go completely around, uh, recently uh, there was uh, a uh, oligonucleotide, antisense oligonucleotide developed for SOD1. And uh, this was tried in, uh, in uh, controls and in patients. And what you can see on the graph on the right is that with increasing dose of this antisense oligonucleotide, 
you reduce more and more the amount of SOD1 that you can see, uh, you can measure in the CSF of individuals. So uh, this antisense nucleotide seems to reduce the amount of SOD1. Uh, this uh, slide is very interesting in that the essentially the top line is uh, the top uh, three graphs are all patients and the bottom three graphs are a subgroup of fast progressing subgroup and so what you can see uh, it's probably better to look at the fast progressing subgroup the blue line uh, the dotted blue line basically shows what happens in the controls so you have worsening of the disease worsening of a respiratory uh, components but the uh, the dotted i guess gold or beige line is with treatment and so you see uh, really a dramatic change in progression of disease with people who are uh, treated with the antisensitive oligonucleotide seem to progress much, much, much more slowly. And what is interesting is the fast progressing group uh, includes the most common mutation is the A4V mutation, which is a mutation in the FAR family in Vermont, described by Sir William Osler. And uh, this study, some points on this graph are actually individuals from the FAR family, from that family that are uh, followed in Montreal and treated in Montreal. So we, we went from, from uh, familial ALS, discovering the disease, to identifying a gene, to getting some understanding of the biology, to the development of a treatment that uh, treats individuals with uh, SOD1 mutations. So this is in fact the first a true disease altering treatment for ALS. Of course, it's only in SOD1 carriers for now, but uh, it's, a, it's a beginning. So I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna talk about neurodevelopmental disorders. There are many, many, many neurodevelopmental disorders. I'm gonna focus on two which are rather common, schizophrenia and autism. Schizophrenia, major mental disorder, it affects about 1% of people, characterized by many different symptoms, but basically it affects cognitive, behavioral, and emotional processes. The genetics, twin studies show high monozygotic uh, and lower dizygotic concordance with heritability of around 80%, so very heritable. However, the genetic studies, linkage and genome-wide association studies, really failed to explain the bulk of that heterogeneity. And only a few genes had been convincingly linked to schizophrenia. CNV studies suggested a role of de novo mutations. So uh, much of the heritability remains unknown. Autism, a different disease, uh, involves a social interaction, communication deficits, and repetitive and restrictive behavior, much younger onset. Uh, and uh, the prevalence, though, is, is, is uh, almost as high as schizophrenia, uh, like about 1% of the population. Again, very similar genetics, very high heritability. Linkage and gene loss studies fail to explain the bulk of the heritability. A uh, limited number of genes have been identified, and CNV studies suggest a role of de novo mutations. Again, little of the heritability has been uh, explained. So where's the missing heritability? Well, heritability is essentially measured comparing monozygotic and dizygotic twin concordance. So the classic ex explanation is that uh, father and mother have uh, all kinds of different variants and different genes, and there's a certain mixture which one child gets but not the other children get that uh, leads to the disease like schizophrenia or autism. And so you would imagine the monozygotic twins would get the same mixture and dizygotic twins would get different mixtures. So that would be one explanation. But is there another explanation? Well, in fact, if you think about it, de novo mutations could uh, could explain the uh, the heritability in that de novo mutations would occur uh, in the uh, sperm or egg, and that monozygotic twins would have the same de novo mutation. Dizygotic twins, one would have the mutation, the other one wouldn't. We know that de novo mutations are very important in many diseases. So, for example, in neurofibromatosis. One in 6,000 live births is a de novo mutation in this one gene. But there are thousands of genes that uh, are code for the brain, and there must be de novo mutations of these. So what phenotype would you get? Well, in fact, if you, if you uh, mutate many, any, uh, many different genes, that if you mutate them, 
you would uh, screw up brain development and have a neurodevelopmental diseases. So the hypothesis or what we thought is the novel mutations can uh, explain the large monozygotic dizygotic twin consortiums and part of the missing heritability. So our hypothesis was that these diseases, uh, schizophrenia, autism, and I include intellectual disorder here because I was a study, but I wasn't the lead of that study. Multiple rare variants that are, in, are generated by de novo mutations could explain these diseases. And it fits with the complexity of the brain. So this would predict two things. One is that uh, there, uh, there would be reduced reproductive fitness, because if there was not reduced reproductive fitness and de novo mutations would uh, lead to these diseases, then these diseases should increase in incidence. But in fact, both in schizophrenia and autism, there is a negative selection. They, they, there, there is, sorry, there is a negative selection that should reduce the number of mutant alleles. Uh, but both these diseases remain at constant high prevalence worldwide. So either there's a strong positive selection, and that's never been demonstrated, or there are new disease alleles continuously generated. So the hypothesis is that uh, new alleles are generated. They don't have many children or less children than normal, and so the alleles disappear. And so it's a balance between generating alleles and eliminating the alleles uh, depending on the uh, reproductive fitness and the rate of the novel mutations. So uh, that certainly fits with the de novo hypothesis. The other is the effect of paternal age. So the male to female ratio of de novo mutations is four to six to one, so many, much more in males, and it increases with paternal age. So it would predict that de novo mutations would more frequently come from males, particularly older males. This has been well, well documented for diseases where de novo mutations are important, like Brett syndrome and NF1. And clinical studies do show an association between increased paternal age and schizophrenia and autism. Again, supports the de novo mutations. So to address this, we did a project called Synapse to Disease. This is a long time ago, or, or anyhow, before uh, high volume sequencing, where we wanted to look for rare high penetrant de novo mutations in neurodevelopmental disorders schizophrenia, autism, and intellectual disability. So this is uh, essentially the design. I can skip over that. So just some results. Uh, at, four, at the point where we had sequenced 402 genes in, in all these individuals, we had 15 de novo mutations that have been identified. These de novo mutations, the ratio of nonsense, so protein truncating to missense, was two to five. The neutral model, in other words, if you have just random mutation of DNA, you'd expect it to be one in 20. So there is a very significant difference between these two, suggesting that there is an excess of deleterious de novo mutations in cases as opposed to what you would expect. And here we look at the rate of de novo mutations. So the predicted rate uh, would be 1.5 so tenth of the minus eight. The observed rate is 6.5. So it doesn't mean that de novo mutations are more common in schizophrenia and autism. It suggests that de novo mutations are responsible for some fraction of cases of autism and schizophrenia. This is just an example of a, one of the studies, uh, one of the genes that we identified, IL-1, RAPL-1. It's an X-linked gene. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, here the parents are normal. And the child has a seven base pair deletion that leads to a truncated protein. And you can see that the protein is truncated here on the Western blot. You have half the size of the protein. So what we did is transfected the uh, neurons, mouse neurons, uh, with uh, these, uh, uh, this gene. And the top control, you can see the, the blue is uh, IL-1, RAPL-1. And you can see that it localizes mostly to the, uh, the extremities of the processes, the dendrites. If you knock it down with the miRNA, you do not get that uh, localization. You don't get the protein. If you knock it out and uh, you express the, 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 the wild type, and this is the wild type that is not knocked out by the, by the uh, uh, miRNA, you, you do see the uh, protein at the processes. But if you uh, use the truncated protein, you don't, indicating that the truncated protein is, as one would expect, uh, deficient. We also found, for example, a de novo mutation in these three brothers with schizophrenia, a protein truncating mutation. Uh, and in fact, the three brothers, it's not familial, but in fact, uh, we had concluded that the 
uh, one of the parents, I forget which one, was a germline mosaic. And so these three boys all have the same uh, mutation in, uh, in shank three. And uh, what you can see, this is a, uh, an experiment using uh, zebrafish. And what you can see in the control, the fish are normal. If you knock it down, the, the fish have a severe phenotype. If you rescue uh, with the uh, wild type protein, you get this, the blue, so you have a uh, good rescue, mild phenotype, but you can't rescue with the truncated protein, which is what you would expect. So it is an inactive protein. So the outcomes, well, we were the first to, to measure uh, the novel mutation rate in humans, and we provided support for the hypothesis predicts that schizophrenia and autism, uh, de novo mutations are an important cause, and the genetic architecture is that of many rare variants in many different genes. So, the phase two, I won't go into much detail, but this is when next generation sequencing, the high volume sequencing, started to appear. And we did a study looking at uh, exome capture of uh, schizophrenia, and it was in different patients, but we in fact replicated the first study. There's an excess of deleterious de novo mutations in schizophrenia and autism cases. So de novo mutations can explain part of the heritability. So the overall conclusion is that hundreds, maybe thousands of genes predisposed to autism and or schizophrenia and or intellectual disability and other neurodevelopmental disorders. De novo mutations are an important cause of these diseases, especially in intellectual disability and autism. And many genes, many of these genes were involved in the synapse. So that's just a little pieces of the science that I've done. Uh, now I'd like to talk a little bit about a social science uh, experiment, if you wish, or social science uh, 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 endeavor. So open science. So a key enabler of research endeavors. And just to say that how we ended up being interested in, in open science is that I'm a neurologist, as you know, and uh, neurological diseases really are the most unmet medical need at this point in time. Tremendous human suffering, economic load, and uh, since 2016, it's the leading cause of disability in the world and second leading cause of death. And there's very limited treatments and no cures at all to the course or eradicate uh, most of these diseases. So there's frustration and a sense uh, of urgency. So we need to shift the pace and do things drastically different. In fact, you know, if I look at uh, when I started uh, as a neurology resident in 1982 and now, there are, for most brain diseases, there are no new treatments. There are no treatments, whether it be dementia, ALS, there's now one treatment that can be used in less than 1% of patients. So uh, there's still a lot, a lot, a lot to be done. So how, how can we uh, go faster? Well. To accelerate discovery of treatments, we need to better understand the brain. So let's face it, the brain is very complicated. Uh, and uh, the brain's complexity you know, necessitates uh, massive collaboration, as well as access and integration of massive amounts of data from various sources. And so basic science needs open science. We need to break down the barriers for collaboration, make collaboration easier, allow fast and reliable reproducibility of data, leverage big data, so, you know, to be able to leverage big data, the big data has to be available, has to be freely available. And then the aim is faster identification of novel targets and reduce the time to early clinical trials. And in fact, it's better use of public money. So uh, the neuro, the institution I, I, I lead, our uh, mission is to understand the brain, find cures and effectively treat people with neurological disorders. So we thought that to achieve this mission or to uh, get closer to this mission or to is, is open science was was the way to go so to expand the impact of research accelerate di discoveries and open science as i said is is not the goal the goal is understanding the brain find cures and effectively treat neurological diseases but it is a means and it's with that in mind that we started moving our institution into uh, open science and it was a bottom-up approach and it was a, a lengthy consultation with faculty staff and students mapped existing activities that are open science to find what open science means for the neuro because it's a term that means 
different things in, in different for different people and in different contexts. We put together a social science study of potential barriers and limitations. We defined the guiding principles uh, with a final buy-in. And then uh, we uh, had to convince the university that we could do this because, of course, everybody at the Neuro is a professor at, uh, at uh, McGill University. So uh, we had support of the university in this. We were fortunate that uh, a benefactor, Mr. Tannenbaum, uh, really liked the whole idea. And so uh, he uh, uh, donated uh, money to the Neuro, $20 million to be precise. This was the opening, uh, this was the announcement. We had uh, the prime minister there. This is uh, the principal, the, the president of McGill University. Uh, it's called the principal, Mr. Tannenbaum. So the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute, which is uh, basically uh, has two missions. One is to implement open science practice at the neuro. So open science requires work to be able to, uh, and, and money to be able to be open and encourage other institutions to embark. So implementing open science as a neuro, these are the guiding principles, public release of scientific data and resources, no later than publication. Uh, we, we encourage external uh, partners to do exactly the same. Uh, we have uh, patient informed consent, privacy and rights are respected. We have no restrictive intellectual property, uh, which basically means no patents. Uh, and uh, autonomy is respected. So if people uh, are free to do what they want, that, which is why we had the bottom-up kind of convince everybody and get everybody on board approach, as opposed to you know a decree, which wouldn't work very well. The key components of open science are the open biorepository, which I'll talk about, the open early drug discovery, which I'll talk about, intellectual property compatible with open science. This is a work in progress. Open access, work in progress. Open data, uh, work in progress. This is the uh, biobank. So it's called clinical, biological, imaging, and genetics information repository. And uh, it is uh, open to the public, of course, you know, with all the firewalls and all the appropriate uh, ethical uh, uh, ethic, ethical uh, framework and ethical controls uh, and, uh, and so it's available so anybody can come and, and get access to materials from the bank. So as I said we have a robust ethical framework, we have an open uh, material transfer agreement, we have a de novo collection of many samples, we have collaborations with industry and we're integrating a, a brain bank, which is at the Douglas Hospital, the biggest brain bank in Canada, and the tumor bank of the neuro into this. And multiple other institutions and projects across Canada are adopting this biobank as the biobank for those projects. This is like the Canadian Open Parkinson's uh, Network uh, and, uh, and others. The second is the Open Early Drug Discovery Unit, EDDU. So it really, it uses IPSCs, induced peripotent stem cell technology, to build industry standard assays that, uh, that essentially we develop with pharma. So pharma are partners, and uh, it's really to be able to identify uh, treatments or drugs or targets that would be important for slowing or halting uh, various neurological diseases. And we work with academic groups to adapt research findings and assays. We do small molecule screening. Our initial foci are on ALS, Parkinson's, intellectual disability, and autism. After four years in the open, we've secured uh, significant funds, one third from industry, a third from philanthropy, a third from grants. Uh, in fact, the industry liked the open model quite a lot, and the philanthropists as well. We have agreements uh, with uh, various organizations to develop industry standard assays, collaborations with industry, as I said, uh, and with drug development companies. And we've attracted a great pool of professionals interested in working at academia. So uh, the other objective of, of, of the Tannenbaum Open Science Institute is to convince other institutions uh, and to I guess uh, be uh, do uh, evangelize. So 
we we document and share, for example, the buy-in process, how that occurred, the principles, toolkit and implementation process, uh, open science contracts and documents, ethical framework, so on and so forth. We are in uh, discussions, very frequent uh, discussions with the governments of Canada and Quebec, various scientific organizations, many different universities and institutes uh, that are very interested in uh, adopting open science practices. Uh, also, the European Commission is very interested. The government of the United Kingdom actually sponsored one of our workshops um, and many other universities uh, across uh, Europe uh, and uh, the Americas, including uh, the Fio Cruz in, uh, in Brazil, uh, Stanford University, so on and so forth, and some activity in Asia as well. So almost done. So this is a work in progress, but initial results are, are encouraging. One of the things we were told was that uh, young researchers would not want to join the neuro because of the open science. Well, it's been the opposite. People are, are, where people are choosing the neuro over other institutions uh, because of the open science. Uh, open science will prevent new collaboration projects with external sh stakeholders. Well, in fact, uh, no, we've increased the number of external collaborators, including non-traditional uh, collaborators, like, for example, in artificial intelligence. Will ethics be an issue? No, it's not. In fact, uh, patients feel empowered, empowered and are very supportive of open science. Will, fa will uh, pharma see the value of open science? Uh, oh, yes, they're uh, actually supporting us in a very important way, much more than ever before. Will donors embark? Uh, we have... Uh, well, 400% increase in the amount of money that we've been raising. Will other academic institutions uh, be reluctant? Well, in fact, we have several uh, institutions uh, in Canada that are very close to adopting open science uh, as well. Stanford has uh, created a center for open and reproducible science, and so uh, open science is kind of spreading across the world. So I think open science will transform the way we all do science, accelerating discovery for impact. So acknowledgements, uh, you know, I couldn't list all the students and postdocs and technicians that worked with me in the years as over a hundred, uh, and uh, they have been uh, they they did all the work as I said, but they've also been fun and inspiring. Many collaborators all over the world, uh, many thousands of patients and funding agencies. So I've had a lot of support throughout my career. So I guess now we get to the questions. And I will stop sharing my screen. I have to. I have to ask. What is that? Is are you a sailor? Is that your? Is that your boat? Uh, well, in fact, it's my friend's boat, and this <laughs> is taken. We crossed the Atlantic uh, with two of my kids. Oh my gosh! Uh, and this is uh, this is in the middle of the Atlantic. It's gorgeous. Gorgeous. It, is, it was a beautiful, beautiful trip. Excellent. Where did you? So where did you travel from? Uh, we went from Las Palmas in uh, in uh, the Canary Islands mm -hmm. to to uh, Guadeloupe. Oh, amazing! Amazing. Well, thank you for such an amazing presentation, Dr. Rulo. I I really I really appreciate going through sort of your your work and your background and and most of most exciting for me and the topic that I'm most excited about is this idea of open science and them and open science contributing to our greater knowledge of and our building of being able to fight disease and and especially neuro neurological disease i know when you when you mentioned parkinson's disease as an example parkinson's disease has hit many people in, in my life and in my family and um and i and i know we we are always searching for new ways to um to kind of discover and figure out you know how to how to treat some of these um some of these diseases for sure so i'm just reminding our viewers that if you do have questions for dr rulo please go ahead and put them in to the chat, which will be this way, yes, <laughs> and uh, put them into the chat, and uh, we will definitely get to your questions. I have one question for you, so and, and it has to do with open science. So, mm -hmm. one of the one of the things is what have what is one of the things that you have benefited from, or you've seen other researchers benefit from in terms of being able to use open science data. Well, you know, I, I'm, me and other research. What happens is. I can give examples, okay? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I there's a, one of the researchers that I recruited, and uh, he, uh, in his thesis, he produced three papers, so you could say three discoveries, 
he got his thesis. He's very happy, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he's gone on to do great things, and he's he's with us now. But he put all his data from uh, his work on the web, basically making it all available to everybody else. Uh, and his data has been used to produce 10 other papers. So 10 other discoveries. So, you know, he generated data. He got what he wanted out of it. He got his, his three discoveries. But others looking at the data, uh, using the data, and maybe using other data as well, but, you know, using his data have, have made 10 other discoveries. And so uh, instead of three discoveries, it's 13 discoveries. From, from the data and counting. So, I mean, that's like a concrete example of a multiplication of discoveries using the same data. Uh, me, I, I've always made all my things available to anybody who asked, whether it be data or biomaterials. The challenge is making it available. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the ethics, of course, is, uh, is important. But if you have, you know, ethical approval to do that, uh, then you know making uh, you know sequencing data available is 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 difficult because it's huge amounts of data. So but but so we but we do this and we're part of all the consortiums uh, and using you know for example there's something called MineE which we contribute to which is uh, sequencing of ALS uh, genomes of ALS patients and controls. So we've been mining the mine e data and we've you know we've had a number of different discoveries that are in the works right now so i think uh you know i think that the that the reality is that computers and the internet have changed how we can do science have made sharing easier and faster and uh and uh machines have allowed us to generate far more data than we could even imagine we could generate uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago so all of that kind of pushes in the same direction. You know, if you generate tons of data, you can ask your questions, but maybe others, or certainly others, can use the same data and other questions that you didn't even think of. So that's kind of, that's the advantage. That's, that's amazing, right? I always think of, you know, when I was, when I was, when I was doing research, you feel very alone doing your research sometimes and very isolated and being able to share that with others and then having them discover things out of your research. I can't imagine a greater a greater joy of being a scientist personally. So I think that's, that's amazing. We have a question coming in on our chat right now that says, um, that asks, so what was sort of the, the initial kind of spark that really moved you into this idea of pursuing open science and looking at open science? Well, that's a very, uh, that's a difficult to answer question. <laughs> I, I, I would say it was a journey. Uh, and uh, I did talk, I do talk about that journey. I had a, an article in Cell. Uh, they, they asked me to write, which is a very personal one on, on the journey. But essentially, um, it's a number of things. One is, you know, uh, I, I had been frustrated by the ability to collaborate and to exchange materials. So you ask for something and uh, it comes back very complicated material transfer agreement with all kinds of things. And then the lawyers from the other institution get involved with the lawyers of your institution. And, and they argue about things which honestly make no sense. You know, there's, there's no value in anything that we're doing monetary, I mean, monetary value, but, but it doesn't prevent, you know, a lot of work being done uh, to be able to, um, to, to share. So there's huge blockage to sharing and to collaborating uh, because of all of these uh, uh, dreams of making money. And in fact, if you look at all the material transfers and all uh, agreements and all the discoveries and the patents at universities, it's like it's one in a thousand that makes money. Uh, and it seems to me a big price to pay to prevent collaboration or hamper collaboration. So sometimes it falls through, you can't collaborate because it gets blocked. Sometimes there are delays of six months or a year. Uh, I mean, I can give an example. So there is a, uh, I work on ALS, as you know, and uh, there is a, a, an important ALS clinic in an important city in Ontario where uh, the patients wanted to collaborate and the doctors wanted to collaborate which meant sharing DNA and information, mm -hmm. but the hospital wanted uh, a material transfer agreement where they would get money and all kinds of things, and it, it fell through. After one year, 
it fell through. So these these physicians and scientists and patients were unable to participate in research aimed at finding a treatment for their disease uh, because of you know greed or perceived uh, perceived uh, value and so on and so forth. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing was that. Um, I was I was asked to do this a special uh, 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 set up a committee to look at open innovation, and uh, that led me to understand the uh, profound impact of the internet and computers on the way we do things. So that was the second second thing, and the third was you know I've been doing this for years. You know I've been seeing patients with ALS and uh, dementia and stuff for years. Is we can't do anything. I mean, we can't do anything more now than we could do in 1981 or 82 when I started doing neurology. And that's pretty pitiful. So we thought, I thought about, you know, how can we make this go faster? So all these different pieces kind of melded together in my mind anyhow and said, you know, we got to go in this direction. And, uh, and this idea, you know, first, I, mean, I didn't originate the idea. Uh, but this idea had a lot of traction within the institution because there were a lot of people who were already uh, very much doing open science. So there are some fields that are already, like in brain imaging, I mean, they're already very much into open science. And genetics has really gone in the direction of open science because you need huge data sets and nobody can generate all the data. So you have to put the data together to answer the questions. So I guess that's a long answer, but it's a it's a journey. Let's say it's it was a slow realization, um, <laughs> but uh, but that's where I land. I loved I love when you said that you know they, they didn't think that young new young you know scientists and researchers would want to come into the open science field, but yet that's where they want to be, right? Um, and I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that highly. We have a comment in our chat that um, coming from, and and, uh, and they say like one of the most interesting assignments that they had in university was in biostats where we were to find the source data from a paper we were using and find something new in their numbers, right? And mm -hmm. how interesting that was. I think that was a, that was a great, a great comment. Um, I'm also kind of curious about when, especially now that you mentioned the, the patients at hospitals, where they want to be involved in research and, and helping. Um, I know, you know, members of my family have been involved in many research studies in different hospitals is, I'm, I'm curious as to how do you discuss sort of the, the ethics and the implications with patients and how do they, how do they, how do they come on board with, with having their personal data being available? Well, you know, the you explain to them, and uh, you explain to them clearly, uh, and uh, you make sure they understand. You know their personal data. I mean, we don't we don't put names, and we don't put. You know, there is there is there is confidentiality. There is protection of of identity. Even though, you know, one could say if you put the whole genome out there, uh, people are completely identifiable. Uh, but but uh, but patients are happy to do that. I, I've I have found that, um, I mean, I've been doing ethics, working with ethics committees for a long, long, long time. And uh, I find that ethics committees often are trying to protect patients, but are not listening to what patients want. Mm -hmm. And uh, I once uh, gave, uh, I was invited to, to an ethics conference. I had no idea why, but then I realized afterwards it was to cause trouble. <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, I, my, the title of my talk was The Unethical Behavior of Ethics Committees. So, um, and because, you know, I deal with patients and, and I know that the majority of them, not all, but the vast majority of them want to do something. I mean, you've got ALS, you're dying of ALS. Maybe it's in the family, you know, you, you know, you're going to die. Uh, uh, you want to do something and, uh, and contributing to research is, is something, you know, really concrete that you can do and to deny patients the ability to fight back if you wish or contribute is wrong and that's what i mean by the unethical behavior of ethics committee so sometimes they're a little more theoretical and they should be a little bit more practical <laughs> not, not to say that you know i mean ethics is super important and uh, and uh, things have to be done right but uh, i think patients need to be more involved in the process uh, 
that's a that's a really good point. I I appreciate that. So and and I think I think one of the things that I sort of take away from this is that there's we've now opened this new world of complete new possibilities, right? When we open up our data, we make it available, um, and uh, and there's um, some really just. I think really interesting things coming out. We have a, a new a new comment that just came in. So this is a great question. How is informed consent obtained from patients when all the possible ways their data will be used may be unknown? Well, you know, the, uh, the informed consent basically says what will be done with their data. So, uh, and essentially their, their data will be made available to be able to uh, identify the cause of their disease or things. Of, I mean, those are the kinds of, of things that are allowed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure what's meant by, I mean, the, the data is generated and the data is made available and that's what the patients are told. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, we, we can't do things that we're not allowed to do. Uh, so the consent is either rather complete. Uh, but I guess the point is a good one. We, we don't know what might be possible tomorrow. And I guess the answer is we can't do it if, if we don't have consent to do it. <laughs> so uh, we try to be as complete as possible. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I know you've been in this field for a very for a very long time now, but there are new you know students who are coming up and wanting to continue the work and work on the work that you've been doing. So one of the questions we had to come in is if you were a high school student today um, with an interest in neurology or another broader field of neurology, what path would you advise or what path would you look at into taking as you sort of move forward in your science career? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess uh, the, there's two streams, right? You can go the medical stream, which is what I did. So you have to become a physician, then a neurologist, and then you go on to do uh, research. Uh, and uh, certainly when I, was, when I was young, I was encouraged to do genetics research, which was very, uh, very, good, uh, very good advice. Uh, what, what should be done now is, you know, I think that Essentially, there are two things that cause human diseases. It's basically the genetic makeup and the environment. Environment's very difficult to study, and I think we still don't have ways of studying it. So I think I would I would still encourage people to go into genetics. Uh, but, but genetics today is very different than genetics when I was studying. I mean, genetics now is much more uh, bioinformatics, more informatics. So it would be you know, neuroinformatics or the, uh, the uh, you know, almost mathematics and statistics uh, as a way to do neuroscience. The other kind of big field of, of neuroscience uh, is, uh, well, there are many big fields, but, but brain imaging is one which is, which is growing and developing. And it also is very bioinformatic and very mathematics. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the last would be uh, the, the physiology uh, which is really has to do with you know electrophysiology and and, and how uh, cells interact. A very good answer, I guess. Uh, I, I, I guess it would be one of those those subfields. Yeah, if you don't go the medical route, then you do a PhD in, in neuroscience, and, uh, but it's the same same field. Yeah, but but all about genetics, right? <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> If you think about it, uh, genetics genetics uh, led to molecular biology. So molecular biology is a, was essentially a branch of genetics. Uh, and uh, if you take molecular biology and you take uh, genetics, genomics, single cell biology, which is genetics, kind of genetics is at the core of, of almost everything uh, that's being done now. And you do the genetic models, uh, animal models are genetic animal models, and so on and so forth. So I think uh, understanding the genetics is very important. Excellent. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Rulo. I really, really appreciate your your, your interesting uh, research and um, really highlighting a lot of this for us today. Um, so thank you for joining us. For those of you out there who have watched our show today, um, I, I just want to give a great big thank you again to uh, Dr. Guy Rulo for joining us and of course the Gardner Foundation for supporting this lecture today. Um, as a reminder, if you would like to see this lecture again en français, we will have a live event at 11 o'clock at 11 heures, and uh, you can join us then. We're going to give Dr. Rulo a bit of a break now, though, and but you can join us back a li uh, live again at, uh, at 11 o'clock en français. So thank you very much, um, Dr. Rulo. This uh, live presentation will be uh, continue to be available here at our YouTube channel here at Science North, so if you want to come back and watch it again, um, it, will, it will live here. Uh, uh, for for the for the next foreseeable future. So, thank you so much, Dr. Rulo, and have thank a you. great day. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Bye.